and just telling chat to refresh now. That is how that works. Uh, hi, everyone live. Hi, everyone watching on the catch up. I hope you are enjoying your Saturday and looking forward to a very respectable, very well argued, entirely sincere stream about a secretly based director working at the heart of Hollywood and occasionally kicked out to the fringes of Hollywood when he's produced something absolutely terrible. Um, Greta Gerwig. <laughs> we, hey, we, we've, we've had some serious guesses about who this uh, secret dissident director I mean, is. Um, they can also see the thumbnail, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, some have said they all look alike. No, I can't start the show like this. I cannot start the show like that. Um, we've had some, some, no, okay, one person has got it. it it's, I mean, I kind of pixelated it. I think that's good pixelation. It looks Chris like Tom Howard. Be proud. Maybe, maybe I just know what <laughs> it is he Tom looks Howard. like. It looks like him. A little bit, yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely pixelation remember the chess club. Works. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, some interesting guesses. There was an early guess for David Lynch, just because I was having you on, Harry. We've got a reputation now. I love well, it. I, I mean, I agree, but I don't think it's any secret, personally. No. Uh, Nicholas Windig Refn, uh, Craig Zahler, D.W. Griffith, uh, Zack Snyder. Just a hey. Clint Eastwood as well. I mean, this once again, this thumbnail does not remind me of Clint Eastwood, but maybe well, I'm, Eastwood I'm, maybe I'm missing a few of his films. Clint Eastwood isn't secretly based; he's just based. And Zack yeah, Snyder, is. unfortunately, isn't based at all because now Rebel Moon has a non-binary protagonist, and I'm just not oh. watching it. Hey man, maybe you're just behind the times. Yeah. yeah. Have Hashtag you read recently? Hate. <laughs> I, I, man, I, I go back and forth on Clint Eastwood because it, he's feeding you such good stuff, and he takes some firm lines, but then, oh, he, he'll he'll take you all the way to twenty fifteen. It's, uh, I know what to make of that. What do you gets, mean by that? How can I? Say, so, there's some nice hard conservative lines, things you wouldn't get in any other movie, in something like Gran Torino, but ultimately. What ends up happening there? What's what's the overall message? I feel like it's a it's a real mix of things in there. In I've, I've not watched it since I was a teenager, so I don't remember. I just remember that he ends up doesn't he sacrifice himself for the Asian family? Yes. Okay, so there is some boomerism. I mean, American Sniper's just like unmitigated patriotic brilliance. Mm. I haven't seen that one. Oh, I, I haven't either. One of my favourite films of all time, and I'm not going to spoil the ending. Holy all right, that's hell. going on the list. That is going on the list. American Sniper. Yeah, it's Bradley Cooper telling the true story of Chris Kyle. And Chris Kyle was the guy that popularised the use of the Punisher symbol um, in the American military. Ooh. Nice. Nice. Yeah. All right. Any Well, recommendation from you guys always goes on my list. Um, the whole vibe of this, by the way, folks, um, we have a fairly strict schedule with the themes because this this is working towards giving you an education in horror movies. Um, but sometimes you want to cut loose. Um, and so this is what I do. We end of the month stream, we go a little off topic, we do something a little wild, and this stream, theorising about Hollywood's secretly based director, is going to do that. Um, Connor and Harry obviously know who it is. Um, uh, we're on YouTube, you know, we should do some, a little bit of shilling first uh, before we get fully into it. And we'll give people time to roll in and start guessing. Yeah, there's a Mel Gibson guess in there. That was going to happen. Peckinpah, strong case in there. Um, uh, Connor, Harry, would you like to uh, drop a little shill? Well, uh, we're both shilling for the same thing. So <laughs> yeah, onlyplans.com forward slash. No, um, yeah, <laughs> lo Lotus Eaters, main, mainly Comics Corner, which is Harry and I's series, our labor of love, which, which goes goes far too underappreciated um mm. new episode well, out. we get good views on it we, we get really good yep. views on it it's just a, a monthly series rather than a weekly series and you need to watch the most recent episodes just so that you can see connor really indulging in the utmost exquisite mwah, autism as we go through <laughs> the entire history of comic books going all the way from the late 1800s to now the first episode's out and we're doing the next episode soon yeah, I'm putting it together, and then and Harry's going to do Berserk Part 2, so he gets his version of Walters. Oh, yes. Berserk yeah, is fantastic. I, I saw you suffering through that, Connor, but you'll, you'll get into it. That said, I've only watched the anime, so I, I, I don't want to spoil judge. it, but when Connor was reading the most recent bit that we've gone through, we've not filmed it yet, but when he was reading it, I was getting quite a few direct messages from him, him just show, uh, taking pictures of the artwork and showing me things, that mentioning things that happened, and go, whoa, what the hell, man, that's really cool, oh my god. 
Yeah, conviction was was far better, the latter half conviction than um than anything from Eclipse. And also I've forgotten Lady Thingy's name, the the blonde bird. What's her name? I I know who you're on about, the one who's part of the Holy Sea. Uh something like that. Um yeah, so so very devout Catholic girl, also super sadomasochistic, many such cases. She's Connor's new bay. New waifu. If she, if she just did the green hair dye at the front, oof. job done. <laughs> job done, right? I know. You can fix her. You can fix her. It's okay. Yep. You you guys, obviously, yeah. Folks, um, Harry and Connor, they are, they, they are the reasons for that £5 a month. Don't, don't drop me anything this stream. Although, if you insist. But uh, go over to lotuseaters.com, sign up, go for the Comics Corner, go for Connor talking... Uh, swaying how many people have you swayed onto the pro-life side now you're going to get the whole office eventually i think a fair few um i think i think josh well, i'm pro-life so yeah yeah jo yes. josh might be the next next to next to fall um which would be momentous to shake him out of his scientism i, um, I, I don't get that vibe but maybe you've been having some private conversations i've not been privy to about that uh, i i i reckon so um and also, uh, there will be an upcoming part two to Evil Origins of Feminism releasing soon, where, where Carl looks down camera and admits a feminist was right. So that is worth paying £5 a month just to watch. God. Yeah. Wow. Damn. All right, sweet, sweet. Well, um, one of the things that you covered in Comics Corner, I think you did this as a Comics Corner segment, is incredibly relevant. I mean... If, if my amazing pixelation that has, yes, I, I now admit it, it's made him look like Todd Howard, hasn't... <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> it just uh, works, guys. Even though Justin Trudeau. So you're finally awake. Gosh. All right. Well, I, I won't keep you in the dark anymore. You guys have got it. You know exactly who it is. It is obviously your boy M. Night Shyamalan is a secretly based director. I, obviously, this is indisputable. Do you even need me to make the case? I yes. think we can just stop here, really. Um, little known fact, uh, the M stands for MAGA. Um, he gets... <laughs> the middle name Knight is from a band organisation, uh, which I can't go into more specifics over. And what? It's fine. We're a few minutes into the stream now. Um, no, no. Um, and most of all, there have been a okay. I see some surprise in the chat. I am I am going to sway you on this one. I am going to sway you. Look, traditionally you would rely on you know um, more traditional American stock for this kind of work, but this is a future, guys. M. Night Shyamalan's exactly the kind of person we now bring in for these um, high pressure roles. He's it, a model he's, minority. Exactly. He's, he's Silent did it from of Hollywood. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean, it's R Rishi's leading the Conservatives <laughs> here, and Shia Milan's lead leading Conservatives there, right? Okay, okay. You've, you've just weakened your case, I'm afraid. But <laughs> ah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I will point out that, uh, obviously, uh, our, our Hindu friends are some of the most reliably uh, Conservative voting uh, blocks in the UK. I mean, it's, it's, it's not helping, is it? No. No. Well, if they're voting conservative, you're not making a based argument. I I will try. Yeah, I thought if I'd, voting I'd at all, you're not making a based argument. Yeah, true, true. Well, <laughs> the M and M hey. stands for monarchist. <laughs> no, not in the least. It stands obviously for now. If if I were cheap, I would. I am cheap. What what else do you expect? He's got the bagger hat on. My argument is already made. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I Every thought hat is MAGA. I thought I would go over a couple of his films because this might have snuck you by, but I, I'll have you know I did my research. The media have been worried about him for a while. You you do a little googling, you find many an article stressed about the conservative underpinnings of M Night Shyamalan's films, and kind of trying to work to coax a quote out of him to you know subtly disavow, uh, say the right thing, bend the knee, and Ad admittedly, he's very happy to do this. Um, His entire most recent film, Knock at the Cabin, was him bowing the knee to that willingly, happily, with a big grin on his face. All of his interviews for Glass as well. It's quite disappointing. 
that oh. saddens me. I'm relying on you guys to make the case for glass to be yes. very subtly based. So I believe in you can do it. I mean, this this might actually feed into something something I'm a bit fascinated by, which is readings of films that are nominally entirely contrary to the director's intentions. Uh, ideally, if it causes a director to come out and disavow um, and, and, and shake their hands. That, that's that's the ideal thing for me here. Uh, isn't isn't that the pro-life take on, uh, what is it, The Silent Place? Yeah, Quiet Place, yeah. Quiet Place, quiet yes. Place, same, with, same with Logan, as we covered. He meant it to be a, a mm. Trump-era commentary on migration and ends up being a parable makes of, no of sense. masculine, just masculine you have seen set by the border of Mexico doesn't make it about migration, for God's sake. Yeah, also yeah. all of those Mexicans who famously flee America for Mexico? Yeah. Makes sense to me. I, I mean, just since you brought up The Quiet Place, anyone who has watched my video on pro-life and pro-choice messaging in horror movies will be aware of what I'm about to say. But I will just point out, yes, uh, John Krasinski did come out and say, absolutely, there is no pro-life message in Quiet Place. And and he even went on to, uh, you know, do uh, big shows uh, for the Biden campaign and, and make a donation even. But let, yeah. let me remind you that in A Quiet Place, a key plot point is that you can distract the evil monsters by making a really big noise. Um, in the film, they use fireworks. Uh, in real life, Krasinski may have used those uh, campaign performances. So that, I'd, I'd just like to put that out there. I think Krasinski is still our guy. Anyway. I'm sorry, I've, I've just seen Murgut put the Unbreakable yeah. Quadrilogy is fairly based. Quadrilogy? I thought it was just a trilogy. Is that a typo, or is there That's a secret be... film that Shyamalan hasn't hasn't told us about that's gonna is be he, is he is he trying to say sixth sense is related to unbreak <laughs> just because it's got bruce willis yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah 12 monkeys is actually the fourth movie in, in the unbreakable quadrilogy <laughs> oh if only uh john garris yes morgoth did do a very good review I, but i would also strongly recommend um last things did an, a brilliant comparison on a quiet place and it, i think it's called bird box so go to Last Things, amazing guy. Some of the best analysis out there. You have to send me those links because I've not read either of those. So that intrigues me. Oh, the chap's amazing. I steal all my ideas from him. Um, ah, that makes sense. So talking about, I mean, this sort of contra intention reading, it's all the ra rage at the moment. Like it's not the first one. Obviously, they live uh, talking about. Um, Control of the media by a shadowy group. Um, I have read the Wikipedia entry. Yes. Yes. Obvious. Some cr John. Car it's okay. John Carpenter shut down all the readings. Shut mm. them straight down. Um, David Cronenberg has uh, reaffirmed that uh, Crimes of the Future is absolutely in no way about transsexualism. Nothing to do with it. And uh, is Videodrome about transhumanism? Ah. Uh, Good. I'm I mean, that's the only Cronenberg film I've watched to my eternal shame. Ooh, I have some projects for you, Harry. Um, we'll I'm always happy to take on film homework. Nice, nice. Um, and oh, Connor, obviously, you. you've been very busy with a film that has a, a, a reading that is very, very contrary to the yes. director's intentions. Yeah, there was there was absolutely no intention by Greta Gerwig <laughs> and uh, Kate Kate McKinnon. No, not McKinnon. Kate. Yes, oh my McKin god, what, is it? Isn't it McKinnon? Yeah, no, no is Kate McKinnon's name. a crazy feminist from the nineties. One from Ghostbusters. She's in it and co-wrote it, didn't she? Is that, yeah, yeah, yeah it's the one party. from Ghostbusters, but I forget her bloody name. Um, yeah, I they, they did Kate McKinnon. No, Kate McKinnon was a was a, if if she shares a name with the nineties feminist, and I've just memory hole, but I'm I'm I mean, gonna right. I'm gonna break out. Yeah, the bloody hell, you're right. Yep, yep. Oh, wait, right. yeah, same yep. name. Yeah, they have the same name. That's hilarious. Um. Yeah, they didn't intend to write the most pro patriarchy movie for the last like decade. They they didn't intend that at all, but they did. Ken is absolutely our guy. The the neo conservatives, right? Yes, yes. I saw Kennerbund recently. I thought <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> the longhouse will continue burning until the Kennedy improves. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love Harry, it. See, you, will, you will absolutely love it. I've already roped Carl into a politics of. Oh my! <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> well, at least Do Carl. It. At least Carl has the excuse of he's got daughters that he can take to see it. 
Oh no, so his wife was pestering him, and then the <laughs> other day, because of the review, he was like, okay, fine, honey, I'll take you to go see it. And and we said, you're going to really enjoy it, though, aren't you? He went, yeah, I, I will admit, it. me and the missus were listening to that review on Monday, and we <laughs> looked at each other, and my missus, she looked me straight in the eye, gave me the puppy dog pleading look, and I said, fine, when it's out on streaming, fine. <laughs> oh dear. It is, worth, it is actually worth watching. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay to see it, even though I did. But it genuinely, you will fucking enjoy it. Claim it on expenses. That's all right. Yeah, yeah we'll do. All right, sweet, sweet. Well, we should um, we should probably provide our own uh, contrary readings here. We should talk about the stuff that the director has, you know, div- disavowed. So it's definitely not in there. No matter how many um, hit hit pieces try and rope him into staying in the line. I mean. So some of these are a bit weak here, right? But we'll get into it. Um, so the obvious one, by the way, guys, um, massive spoilers for basically everything by a director who's famous for films with twist endings. Um, just thought I should put that out there. I'm, I'm going to spoil pretty much everything he ever did. If you don't want to be spoiled on all of these... Um, Although I, I, I have to yeah. say, not all twists are created equal. Certainly not Shyamalan twists. And not mm. all of these films are created equal either. I will say mm. I watched this first one for the first time earlier today. And it was... <laughs> I was... Um, it's kind of magnificent, yeah? Uh, I had to drink a few cups of coffee to keep going and stay yep. awake, if I'm perfectly honest. Because this yeah. was so dull. This entire film was boring i'm sorry i've got to break it to you i'm not gonna lie it 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 has no energy whatsoever it's um it's very confusing to me why it's done so incredibly maudlin and slow um when i rewatched it i did find myself thinking like blooming heck was it always this glacial for a man um, who's known for getting weird stiff performances out of great Oscar winning actors. This was the worst offender I've seen so far. Not a drop of emotion from a single person, except for Adrian Brody, because he was playing the village retard. Uh, I mean, I've, I've never seen a film where the main plot centered around a love triangle between a cripple, an autist, and a retard, where the retard almost wins. It was... <laughs> it was shocking. And then Nothing happens until halfway through the film, and then the rest of the film is them going, hey, we've got an incredibly dangerous forest that we need to send someone through. I don't know, let's send the blind person. That's a brilliant <laughs> idea. Let's send the blind person out to get medicine. What the... M. Night was going... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was very frustrating. M- many cups have been thrown at screens over that decision. Um the- There is no justification. It's oh, probably and then, and then the-, the retard comes out and seemingly just falls over and dies. I guess, like Padme, he simply lost the will to live. Hang on, don't you dare bit. trash Revenge of the Sith. No, I won't. I, I won't. But that, that line I just felt was relevant in the comparison because I don't want to go on about just random stupid things that happen in this plot, but I just need to get this off my chest, all right? M. Night, right, set it up quite well okay at least in how she was going to get rid of this man dressed as a monster which was that she's running about in the woods and she comes across a fallen over tree with a big spike sticking out of it and you think okay we're going to get a, a what what's the todd and something against evil situation where someone impales themselves on the stick a bit of wood sticking out okay and he runs at her she dives out of the way and then you don't see him impale you see him trip over and then it cuts away cuts back and he's just on the floor dead. No wounds anywhere. He's just got a bit of blood on his head. He's crying and he cries himself to death. They they wouldn't let M. Night basically show any gore. Very hesitant to do it. Very, oh, very stupid. Resistant. But yeah, the, the edits on that. But do, don't don't lose yourself up in minor details like um, the plot. Direction. Like how the main antagonist pivotal, dies. Pivotal character movements or anything like that. Think... Think about the main message again. Died of a huge broken spoiler. heart, man. It's deep. It's so deep. <laughs> oh, come on. Look, you, you know exactly what I'm saying with this. This is a film about the rev turn. This is this is Luddite revolution. This is full on Ted pilled. This is a, a whole group of people who are in modern modern society, Detroit, I believe. And Detroit is so bad that they're like, sod it. We're going back a few centuries. Off we go. <laughs> This is a flight back to the Middle Ages. Yes. 
It is. Isn't it also basically an ethno state? Yes. M. Night yeah. Shyamalan oh, himself yeah, totally, in his totally. classic cameo is the only person <laughs> in the film who is not pure white. Behave he's, yourself, he's, chat. He's, he's in the, Outside he's in the of day. maybe Joaquin Phoenix. I don't know about anybody else, but you know. Um, I mean, there's Jesse Eisenberg. But... Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. He showed up in it for two scenes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Should the, we get on the, the reading then. The cast of this is weird. I mean, you can also see Fran Kranz in the background there. Early Fran Kranz for Joss Whedon appreciators. Um, oh, and the guy from Boardwalk Empire who had sex with his own mum as well. <laughs> I did I not know finish that show, and I'm Board very glad. Empire, Ed but... Kemper? <laughs> Have you not seen that show? No, no, no. Yeah, that was a bit of a twist I wasn't expecting when I watched that. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. It's anyway, weird. so. The the reading like this is this is white light out of uh, modernity in in many senses of that word. Uh, the big twist as you get is that they're living on a reservation and they're return they've returned to traditional values and everything's you know doing pretty well. They're they're wholesome. They're happy. It's all that good stuff. Weirdly, you know the the lack of caffeine is extremely evident in every single performance. <laughs> but otherwise, they're doing pretty well. Look at how wholesome they are, right? Uh, perhaps there's an abundance of opioids in that reservation. That would explain the performances. Maybe, maybe. I mean, what do you think? I mean, is is that pushing it? Going for going for reading the village as a rev turn? Like, haven't we all talked about this? I, mean, I don't think there's any other reading that could be taken from this this film. Um, because one of the things, outside of my frustrations with the problem with the pacing, the plot, the acting, and the <laughs> the, the twists, is that th the thing that I did like about it, it didn't treat these people and their decision uh, in, with any sort of malice whatsoever. The film took their decision with respect. The problems that come out of the decision that they took to retreat from modern society meant that, yes, they have a lack of medical supplies, which causes them a lot of heartache, and they, the characters are all um, uh, are all facing the consequences of that and have difficulties with that. But overall, they still choose to live within that society that they've built, and the mm. film doesn't seem to be passing judgment on that. It could have been very easy to portray every single one of these, uh, similarly to Adrian Brody's characters, where they're just a mm. bunch of backwards retards in the woods LARPing, but instead, it does treat them with a little bit of respect. They've built something that actually works for them. And I find mm. it hard to take any other reading of the film, but that for the circumstances these characters found themselves in that led them to make that decision, that this decision is one that is acceptable to M. Night Shyamalan. He's not hating them for it. Yeah, yeah. I think probably the... Um, yeah, th that's all fair. I'd, I'd say like th the possible counter-readings... Probably just fits into one of the, the kind of stuff you highlighted of uh, why does that happen? And that's uh, the idea that do they all feel that they need to disband it and go back to modernity at the end? It's kind of vague. It's not really clear why they would make that decision that if you lose one person here, then you go back to modernity. It's kind of a midwit point, you know. Hey, it, it's very sort of, hey, guys, did you? I mean, there were murders back in the 1800s too, you know. <laughs> so, but the yeah. only person who tries to murder anybody in this film is the village retard. So it's not even necessarily that it's the built-in tensions that come from such a small um, community. It's literally because one of them has learning impairment that means mm. that he's not able to understand social situations properly and lashes out as a result of that. And that is still something that happens in modern eras. I've known plenty of my friends who have worked in care jobs before where they've been handling mentally impaired people and they still do things like that. They still will try and hurt you. If you get mm. them with a the knife, they will try and stab you if their circumstances lead them to that kind of behavior. So I wouldn't say that's passing judgment on these characters either. Oh, not at all, not at all. The, the only thing that you could say is it was a bit silly of them to leave behind modern medicine, but that's the decision that they made that they deal with throughout this. Because they, like I say, they constantly talk about They've all felt heartache as a result of that mm. particular decision. They've all lost people. The film opens with them losing a child by the looks of it, mm. by the size of the coffin that they're all mourning. But and what, what you're saying is about the end, it being ambiguous as whether they're going to return to modernity or not. I don't actually think it is. All of the village elders all stand up and say that they agree that they're going to continue the society that they've built. And also, um, what, what's, what's the name of the 
uh, Adrian Brody's character. It's not Lucius. That was Joaquin uh, Phoenix. But I never remember anyone's name. That's all right. I'm um, literally Brody. like protagonist or actor name. Brady uh, Brody, his character mm. dies, and they say that they're basically going to cover it up and mm. blame it on the monsters that they've all pre been pretending to be to keep people within the reservation. So within that context, and that just means that okay, they've actually found a way to keep the myth alive Ooh. and actually found a way to reinforce the danger that lies in the forest, which will make it so that the people in the village want to stay in the village even more. And they even say mm. that they're going to keep the society going. They say, without the, we're, we're, we're taking this risk because without somebody going out and doing it, without somebody going out and getting this medicine so that Joaquin Phoenix can stay alive, they're probably going to end up being the elders of the village a few decades mm. from now so they need to be the one to keep the vision going so i don't even think it's particularly ambiguous so if, if M. they M. were wobbling was... on it weren't they they were openly considering and wondering like i felt that was a weak bit but maybe that was well, just I... to give the elders something to do when they yeah, were... the, the elders were desperately in need of something to do in fact one of the elders specifically is hinted to possibly be killing some of the livestock they have for no particular reason in mm. one line and then that entire plot point is dropped so that just feels like it was a subplot that was supposed to go somewhere, but was maybe left in after a re-edit. I hadn't picked up on that. I, I read it as Brody doing that. Oh, may, maybe, but um, the, um, the the guy says specifically that it was one of the elders doing it, and we think he's going to stop now. So Brody wasn't one uh, of the elders. Interesting. Okay. I, I had missed that. I would re-watch, but... It's definitely it, boring. It's so, it's so slow. <laughs> It is so slow. I mean, I, I I worry it might infect the stream if we keep going on it. So shall we? We'll go to some livelier films, right? But this this is getting the thumbs up. By the way, chat. If you are convinced, can I can I have a convincing argument? Can I have an affirmation? It's May not ask? that's that's not just a shallow attempt to get the algo going. And uh, also on. smash it's... like and subscribe. Yeah, you know the stuff. You guys are veterans now. And if you notice, there's a bell down there. Then you know what to do. But um, what what's M Knight's ability? What what's been his attempt to try and disavow this reading that is the obvious only real reading that you can take from the film? So I haven't got a reading on this specific film, but when he was writing about Split and Glass, people came to him and they were they were very much pressuring him to disavow your boy Donny. Um, and so you're saying about split is really about where we are as a nation at the moment. You know, we're all quite divided and people were calling me up. And when Donald got elected, because we were so surprised and they were saying, oh, gosh, it feels like it's an M. Night twist. <laughs> and that was his thing to basically say, look, we're all very shook up. This We're all very surprised. Do you know Hello, about fellow the, liberals? Do you know about the Friends of Abe? Friends of Abe? No. Friends of Abe. OK, so Friends of Abe is a organization in Hollywood for conservative creatives. And it's kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous, but with no alcohol. It, they all have to swear their allegiance and and apologize before they join. It, yeah, it's Conservatives Anonymous. It's incredibly tightly kept. You have to be brought in by someone who's already in because they are incredibly aware that they will be blacklisted in Hollywood. Uh, I was reading an article from them uh, looking for stuff about conservatives working in Hollywood, feeling that they're blacklisted, feeling that they're marginalized. And that's why I read about Friends of Abe, which is about 2,500 people. But uh, really the, mem many. the membership is secret. Um, will that also include production staff and crew? Um, possibly, possibly. I mean, I, I feel like it wouldn't come up as much, but it's more about your your ability to affect the film. But the fact that they have to have this kind of secret um, fraternity in there, basically. Um, there's a few people who are more obvious about it. Obviously, Gary Sinise, James Woods um, are good John examples. Voight as well, I'd imagine. John Voight, yeah, definitely. Clint Eastwood, as we've mentioned, they're in there. But I think you've seen what happens to them and you know... You can understand why they keep it completely anonymous and have quite a level of security around it. Yes, I, I can I can understand that completely. I, that's very fascinating. I wasn't aware of that um, particular section of Hollywood. Honestly, I thought that they just mm. I thought they just purged them all by this point. Because sadly, most of the conservative 
former Hollywood aficionados that I see these days make absolute tripe like My Son Hunter that came out last mm. year. That seems to be where the most of them who aren't as left-wing as the rest of them go. And that's that's quite sad to me because not only yeah. do they get removed from the Hollywood establishment, although to be fair, that could be seen as a blessing, um, mm. they also then go on to prove that they're not that good <laughs> or if they're trying to make more conservative films, that they're not very good at it. Most of the time mm. when I see somebody who's an outright conservative filmmaker outside of maybe somebody like clint eastwood um their films are mostly terrible and mm. the but most based films that come out of hollywood tend to be the ones like this that are completely by accident yeah i mean adventure I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you completely there like it's it's a thing i think of pandering is just cringe the obvious pandering ruins it whereas if you i forgot who said this but if you just make good art it will naturally appeal to us it's yes. the the distortion of the thing for the message always wrecks it even though i tend to be more sympathetic i i, I am one of those people who will say okay that doesn't make sense but when you consider the message and how cleverly it's it's a weakness it is a bias and i i'm, at, I'm literally like holding my hands up but i'm not on camera so you can't see but <laughs> anyway um, I'll, I'll go on to some readings of um, maybe you say those are a little further out. Let's see how we go on this one. I think I think you'll approve. OK, um, I've not seen signs, but I have seen the other two. All right. Um, you don't mind me spoiling the heck out of it, right? I know it's aliens, and I know that if you throw water on the aliens, then they explode, which is very silly for them to come to a planet that's mostly water. But that's neither here nor there. It's weird that that twist was used twice, you know. Uh, blooming twice. Um, oh, help me out, guys! Um, the one, in, uh, it, they're from Mars. Come on, um, Spielberg made a film, War of the Worlds. There we go. Oh, I thought that was that they aren't adapted to the microbes on the planet and get ill and die very easily. But I that... thought it was moisture in the atmosphere that got. Oh uh, well, I've, I've either way, that's what I've heard. I've not. I've not watched that either, so. Hmm. Yeah. Um, it's it's okay. a similar twist either way. Well, uh, you know, we can start with signs because it's a really strong one in my absolutely flawless reading. I'm seeing okay. recommendation for uh, Nocturnal Animals. I have not heard of this, guys. Do you want to drop a little more detail in Nocturnal this? Nocturnal Animals. I'm sure I've watched that film. Let me just check that it's and I'll say I'll... Nocturnal Animals. Oh, yes, that's the one with Jake Gyllenhaal and Amy Adams, and it's directed by Tom Ford, uh, who's the fashion designer. Oh, um, yes, yes. He um, he made that really good film with... Um, oh, I can't remember it's, anyone's it's blooming the, name It's the ultimate based Sigma um, film. And oh, I'm, I'm being unironic with that. If you've ever wanted to see a man completely destroy his toxic ex, then you watch that film. All right, sweet. Although it does, it does have a horrifying opening scene, and not for gore, but because it has a, it, it had to open with you know, ooh, look at me, I'm an artist. One of those those moments because it's a mm. slow motion, big fat woman who's topless, jiggling her breasts straight into the camera in slow oh. motion. That the almost made me switch it off, but the rest of the film made up for it. You start your film, you've got your popcorn, and they hit you with a Lizzo in 4K. That's not... <laughs> that's savage. Colin Firth, thank you. Chat, can I ask you, what was Tom Firth, Tom Ford's first film with Colin Firth? I really liked it, and the name... Yeah, Suitable Man, that might be it. Thank you, wifey. I've not heard yeah, of that. I enjoyed that. I mean, you, it's quite homoerotic, so you might not go for it, um, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, all right, so you know, we'll we'll start with signs. So, one, Mel Gibson's in it. Some even say Harry that M Night Shyamalan is who who put Gibson onto everything. Some people say that. Oh, really? Maybe more than me. You let him into the club. Oh my god. I mean, it's, some people say I I make this kind of stuff up and could be sued, but I'm sure there's an other uh, there's another person who has it. That's it, Doctor Prepper, a That's single right. man. Thank it you. Was, but the, don't worry, I'll take the fall. It was actually me that told Mel Gibson everything. 
I was six years old, but I was I was very switched on. You know, I've got my pattern recognition was very developed from an early age. You turned up to a. He was doing an audience signing for Lethal Weapon Four. You thought it was a bit of a reach, but you really liked Joe Pesci, and Jet Li was hot at the time. So you turned oh, yeah. up, and when Mel leaned in, you're like, "Hey, Mel, don't you ever think it's funny how?" Have you noticed then... that the, the, there's a pattern with the surnames of the people that are financing <laughs> your films, Mel? Have you noticed that? <laughs> <laughs> Except obviously, I was six, so it's a bit more high pitched. So you'll have to add some artistic license. Even a six year old. Anyway, I will get off this. I think we're still monetized. Yeah, it could. It could be Hopefully, true. Hopefully, let's. Yeah, let's let's keep it that way. Where are you? We're still. So Mel good. Gibson's in it, so that immediately wins it. At least, what would you say? Like a plus three on the base dometer. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Mel, that got to have that. Uh, it's worth at least you know, two base points, right? The big twist in science is it's not just aliens. It's that there's also uh, guidance by God. God is explicitly real in signs. Uh, Mel's uh, priest character lost his faith, and it's about guiding him back to faith. Oh, and really? realizing that God set everything up um, for him so that he could do what he needed to do to protect his family. Okay, yeah? so, so in this, God is confirmed real, and also yes. God is confirmed to have created aliens that, are, that have the stupidest plan ever. Just so this this sounds like God's really twisty way of just getting round back round to Mel Gibson. Mysterious ways. It, All yeah. roads lead to Gibson, Harry. <laughs> you telling me I need to buy a new Les Paul? <laughs> uh, I'll yes, do it. it. Yes, and you know what? Do um do the politics of Les Paul guitars and and just expense it, right? Isn't that oh, how yeah. it works? Yeah, I'll it's, need a to it's a deductible. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, there's a few thousand pounds I need you to cover if you don't mind. Here we go. Sorry. The Enriab, yes, that's it. That's it. Oh my god. Thank you. Yes, you don't see it. I don't think you actually ever see any ships. No, they are demons. Um okay. that's, that's, yes, that's an you. interesting that's take. Mm. See, no, I, I think it's film, I'm just going to nod along with everything else. You can't okay. see me. My camera's off, but I'm nodding. Well, we'll just, you know, assume I am right about all of this. And I and always do. Fine. Thank you. I always do. You. Whenever I think, whenever anybody asks me a question, I think, what would proper horror show say? Aww. Basically, stuff the Neil Mohan doesn't allow. But, <laughs> all right, so let's go back to the debut. The Sixth Sense, right? This this is more nebulous, okay? But, you know, there is afterlife. The main struggle here is, you know, it's just a little detail, but the single mother isn't, you know, a kick-ass girl boss who don't need no man. She's blooming, struggling, and having a horribly hard time. So no girl boss reification. We like that. Um, it's a nice realistic portrayal of, the, of that difficulty, right? But the, the main thing... At the centre of the movie is the love story and the sanctity of the marriage between Bruce Willis and his wife. Mm. You know, in that film, she can she married him, she loves him, she can never get over it. You know, she still watches the wedding footage. The sanctity and sacredness of marriage. I, I'm possibly being tautologist there. Um, but that is central to the movie. And it's just a... It's no one getting up on the box and, and sort of waving a flag, but it's a subtle bedrock value in the film that's kind of easily overlooked. I, I can see the reading. It's been a while since I've watched The Sixth Sense, and I, I will be perfectly honest. I find it to be as a, a film that is as quite like The Village, slow and dull. Um, he's M. Night, you know, he's my boy, but... Mm -hmm. He has a particular, especially in those first few films that he made, he had a very particular slow-paced style mm. where all of the performances are very subdued. And it really works for Unbreakable, which we'll get to. But oh, yes. for, the, for the sixth sense, for such a um, supernatural plot that was going on, I did wish that he had just, I, I don't know, made it more interesting to watch. But I can see the... I can see the way that you're taking this I, I will just say though that i feel like i feel like and don't take this personally it's a it's a little bit of a reach 
because it feels more just like the schmaltzy Hollywood. He was supposed to be the next Spielberg. What's the easiest mm. way to get the Oscar nomination? Let's have a broken relationship where one can't get over the other, and then let's throw a little bit of that M. Night spice on there, where it's a twist, and he was dead the whole time. Spoilers for the chat, by the way. I'm really sorry if nobody had known that, but Bruce Willis is a ghost. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, we, we, we were just picking this up on that, yes. Um, we, we recently watched the 1985 revival of um, The Twilight Zone, and the first episode is Bruce Willis, and it's I mean, I think he may have half-inched quite a lot, to be honest. We did notice this. Well, hasn't but... he got dementia? Oh, no, sorry. This is Bruce Willis was in the 1985 uh, Twilight Zone. Oh, okay. So this was, you know, a shocking amount of time ago. So it's it's all good. It's all good. Um, so not dementia, but, but still bald. He wasn't even bald at that point. And, I'm uh, pretty he, sure it was a toupee. Oh, I don't know. You, you would have to watch the uh, the very first story in the very first episode. I'll just uh, welcome Connor back there. Good to see you, Connor. Hello, oh, yeah. all. I fell into uh, the, the rabbit hole of Boomer Media for a moment there, but I've oh, recovered. We forgive you. We're rescuing you. We're pulling you. We're pulling you back out, and we're just talking about the the sort of bedrock sanctity of marriage that's at the base of the Sixth Sense. As just a, a very subtle inkling, uh, it was a cute a reach, but um, it's nice to be in there. And I was just about to move on to the visit. This, okay, is some... this is this is the one that Harry has told me is dreadful and to never watch it, right? Um, I, well, I let's knock at the cabin. You have his films, to be honest. I mean, just, just to, to mention one of his particular films that doesn't exist. Somebody mentioned No Last or, uh, Airbender. He never made that film. That film. Yeah, that, that, go back to sleep. Don't, yeah, don't believe it, Richard. Uh, no, 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 no. Well, uh, look, we don't have to. We we don't have time for all the films, so I'll just leave out ones that are, you know, inconvenient. That one doesn't happen reading. anyway. Everybody, yeah. that was a mass hallucination. Yeah. Um, so, The Visit, very subtle one. It, it, some could call it a reach, but subtly, right? So, Visit, and again, I'm spoiling everything, every single movie in this. Um, if you there aren't aware of it... There is a 12-year-old rapping in this, so this is... I'm interested to see where you're going to take this one. Oh, I had blanked that out. Oh, dear. Anyway, right, I'm, I'm going to blank it out again. So the whole thing is single mum, has two kids. She's estranged from her family, but she gets back in contact with her parents and she sends her kids to stay with their grandparents. And that's what the visit is. That's the uh, titular visit. I think I can't call it eponymous because that's not a name. So they go. It gets weird there. The grandparents, they're being super creepy and weird. They do crazy stuff at night, okay? And it turns out that actually the grandparents, shock twist, aren't their real grandparents. They're a couple of crazy people who killed the grandparents, stashed their bodies in the basement, and are taking over. Now, some may say the twist is absolute nutso and doesn't work. That's beside the point. And is telegraphed from the very opening of the film. Well... Oh, really? What telegraphed it? Um, uh, the, the, the fact I that they're obviously it. crazy and acting like nobody's grandparent oh, ever. Go. And one yes. of them is... Do, well, it, it makes it seem like they're supernatural. I mean, the gran is running around naked and making weird animal noises. When, Look, when, she, when one of the kids gets chased around by the gran under the floorboards of the house, you're literally hearing lion noises being put over the top of the film. But no, they're just crazy people. Look, Harry, I have to put my foot down. We are on Neil Mohan's platform here, and I need to remind you that actually dementia is is very common. It's very natural. And you might be here that we... Ah, oh, I was going straight there. Doesn't <laughs> stop you being president. <laughs> Why can't you host you? Ah, damn it. You're too quick. You're too quick, Connor. I've never heard Biden make lion noises straight <laughs> into a microphone yet. Maybe he, next time he breaks out something. and has a moment. Maybe next time he has an elder moment in one of his yeah. speeches. He's, he's, he's got, he's got, a, he's got a sniff an extra wonderful smelling brand of kid shampoo before mm. he gets to that level. Yeah, you might hear he's got that dog in him. If he, uh... anyway, <laughs> the the point, the thing easily missed. This whole film doesn't work. There's a second part of that sentence. The whole film doesn't work unless. The family is estranged. This whole tragedy is only possible 
because of the superbly unnatural separation of the family. It's highlighting how weird it is for the generations to be apart. The tragedy of familial alienation. It's, again, the bedrock of the film. Right? I, I mean, you are <laughs> right that had they had a closer relationship with the grandparents already, this never would have happened. So I, I can see it. Once again, it seems more like a, an annoying plot contrivance for mm -hmm. the sake of building tension and having an unnecessary twist in there. But um, it, it could also be that M. Night Shyamalan is actually super secret based MAGA. So maybe it's one or the other. But is it one of those situations where, like, you know how the right, quote unquote, are now celebrating J.K. Rowling for understanding there are two sexes? Is oh. it just the fact that a family exists is now right wing? Look, I, I've right got to, I've got to work. <laughs> it's 2023, Connor. I've got to work with what we've got here. You know, I but mean, in you a way, just do a half hour review <laughs> congratulating the Barbie film on being based, man. So yep. <laughs> where we're at. Yeah, it's um, so um. I mean, at Did least Ryan Gosling does say patriarchy is based based on God's word. <laughs> does he say that in the That's film? That's a line in the film. <laughs> no, you're kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> okay, maybe I do need to pay money to see this now. He slides down the front of a car hood and says it. Oh my God, he's literally me. Yeah. I need to actually check that. If that's true, that's amazing. That's meme of the year. Bloody hell. <laughs> okay, so look, the distributist made a point about how horror is inherently reactionary because you notice that a lot of the scenarios that uh, come up in horror that enable the killing and the shit and the, you know the chases and the boob shaking up and down as you try and escape the mass killer they kind of rely on a logic that is anti-traditional if you had a traditional religious uh, normal family basically you'd be pretty safe from most horror threats um, I was like, I've I've imagined many a time a sort of scenario, a, a skit, if you will, um, but post channel awesome. We don't want to go there. Of a, a cop going door to door in a neighborhood, like warning families as a mass killer, going all Michael Myers in the area. So uh, just tell your kids not, you know. And he comes up to a like a Mormon household and says, "Look, guys, mass killer in the area. Be on your watch. Don't have your kids staying up after midnight." Oh, yeah, they wouldn't. Oh, um, like not not going to like the lovers' lane. Yeah, they wouldn't. Oh, you know, just kind of highlighting that y you wouldn't be in the risk if you weren't taking these risks. Yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah. so well known this trope that it was satirized in the cabin in the woods, the Joss Whedon one, where they play up to the fact that yes, it's always the pure virgin who survives till the end of the classic slasher film. Mm. I'm safe, boys. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, well, you know, so th those are subtle things. And then uh, this is your speciality, guys. This is your speciality. You did a very good job on this. Mm. Thank you very much. The Thank subtle... You readings of the east rail it's east rail 177 isn't it 117 um, i thought it was 117 i will trust you on that um there's quite a lot in in this quite a lot i mean from the sort of bruce willis as a it is, one, it is 177 shit sorry oh. to interrupt <laughs> Absolutely disavowed, disowned, humiliated, live on stream, caught out. He's never Do you want to give you... from this? It's never been more over. Oh, I'll hand him my notice in the morning. NGMI. Look, I've yapped for ages. Um, do you want to? I mean, talk me through. Do you think there are some subtle conservative things in East Rail 177? I think the first one is a treatise on becoming the hero that your son will always see you as so there is because it's a very relational film there's a very mm. conservative message about fatherhood in the second one i think it's reactionary only in the same way of of horror being innately reactionary also mm. uh the the core of it comes from a creepy predator as as one of the villains that's something very 
Can, can I add to Split as well? Yep, please do. Uh, there is also the idea that no matter how much you try to help some people, some people are just wrong to the core, which is very, very much against leftist egalitarianism. Yes. Also, it's very transphobic with Miss Patricia. Um, <laughs> Wait, and are then... you saying it's transphobic just because you can defeat the villain by dead naming him? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually something that happens. You're right, and yeah. and also that that he when he when he gets out of his dress, he's a giant cannibalistic barbarous animal who can literally climb walls. Yeah, but you are um, right. They say his real name, Kevin, and then he just snaps out of it. Yeah, yeah. the beast is basically hot. What did he mean by this? <laughs> <laughs> um, and and he eats and he eats young girls and likes to see them undress. So so you know. That's true. Go go to your go to your average uh, anti anti Posey Parker rally and, and you'll find Kevin <laughs> Wendell Crumb. Um, and then then Glass is a total accident because mm. it was meant to be about the marginalised and the oppressed and the broken being pure, um, but it was actually about a shadowy cabal of people who run the media and the psychiatric institutions and the government suppressing exceptionalism and gaslighting the populace into being mediocre. Yes. Your reading where you point out that Bryce Dallas Howard uh, is basically long housing them, basically isn't breaking. It, uh, isn't it um, uh, Sarah Paulson? Paulson? Yeah, Sarah Paulson from American what? Horror Story. Not, yeah, Bryce not Dallas Howard's the one in the village. Is it not? Oh my goodness. I thought I thought it was Bryce Dallas Howard. No, Bryce no, Dallas no, Howard's no, much in the village. Looking. My well, goodness, this is Sarah Paulson. Yeah, uh, this and this one, seeing as so much of the glass boom. takes place in the mental facility, it's also uh, accidentally saying that psychi uh, psychiatry is mainly a form of thought control rather than mm. anything that's yep. intended to help people. Yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, we'd we'd be leaning on Foucault a bit, but um, I think I think we can where it makes sense. The I idea of the construction of pathology here, and in this case, the suppression of exceptionalism, it all fits. I think in. I'm I'm not Foucault's type, am I? I've got double digit age. Yeah, it, <laughs> it wouldn't work. You wouldn't want to lean on me. Yeah, you can run away. Um, yeah, no, Illich wrote, I think. Think very well about this, not in the uh, in medical nemesis, which is something I need to I need to cover at some point. Um, he has some very Ted Kaczynskian opinions about medical technologies and and uh, state institutions, which I must disavow, of course. Ooh, but, I need that. I need that reference. Um, you never feel good when you cite Foucault, you know. Yeah, uh, Illich. Illich is. I've described him as the Ted Kaczynski of gender, but he's also the Ted Kaczynski of medicine. He's very interesting. Um, video on him coming out soon, but. It's hit one of his main points, and, and this goes to the heart of hospitals, and I think mental hospitals mm -hmm. as well, is that as the Industrial Revolution abstracted upwards from community enforcement, yes, we got more sterile medical settings, yes, we got the benefit of um, a greater life expectancy, but when you institutionalize something, you create the perverse incentive to perpetuate the existence of the institution. And mm -hmm. so taking it away from local midwives, medicine men, and churches, no matter how much less effective they are instead you get a point of where they induce learned helplessness create greater illnesses and then sell you the treatment rather than the cure and mm -hmm. that is definitely the case with with uh dr staple gaslighting them into believing that their own superpowers are actually psychological delusions and so then that that legitimizes the reason for the clover organization to then conduct lifelong surveillance on them so as long as they don't get in, out of control they they don't have to be put down because like they're they're one of her pet projects she hasn't succeeded yet in this trial program and so they would have to be lifelong monitored by the institution to be continually gaslit hmm. and and if it weren't a very well-funded very um uh, shadowy backed organization they wouldn't be able to do that so the upscaling of things to an institution means that it's it it becomes that sort of like straussian universal homogenous state thing and it's just uh just interesting hmm. there's a little bit of boomerism in it as well in the idea that ultimately you're you're going to overthrow this shadowy organization by people power you know oh, you're yeah. going to wake the normies up by posting uh videos on youtube 
if all of the people just know what's really going on and if we tell them and if they all create a big movement from the bottom up no i don't think it is that though it's work i don't think it is that and the reason is it's not about creating a revolution of the masses but rather it's about emboldening the exceptional minority to step forward and use their powers because there's very few among the population that actually have powers but they can display them if it becomes a mainstream thing if we take that reading that it's a signaling to encourage a future vanguard, okay, we will, I'll take off the boomer label. I think yeah, you, you make an interesting case in that one. Secret the, Leninism. Yeah. The attempts to, I mean, just the attempts to call this um, an extremely liberal progressive film, I'm particularly unbreakable here, by the way. They feel so desperate Yes. that I feel you've just got the win instantly, right? So I've got an article from, oh, I'm sorry here. Which one is it? Oh, uh, is it Little White Lies? No? Yeah, it is Little White Lies. I did a little trawl for what um, progressive publications were saying about Shia Milan, looking to see if he'd ever sort of, you know, gone to a Lizzo concert or something, something <laughs> that would fatally undermine uh, my case. Right. So, so this is from Little White Lies. Shia Milan's political streak is particularly evident in one of his earliest films. The political imperative of 2000's Unbreakable lies less in asking why American culture idolizes superheroes and more in questioning who gets to be the hero. Samuel L. Jackson's Elijah Price, Mr. Glass, points out the essential physical difference between comic book heroes and villains. See physiognomy check. So... <laughs> Anyway, biological essentialism. It's so true. Um, the classic superhero has a square, sharp jawline. The villain's head is a little too big for his body. See, phrenology pill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you I see, there's, par- there's a partial gap in Samuel L. Jackson's hairline where you can see two small rivets in his skull. Mm, see? Kenology Kenol- and phrenology blend them together. All right. On an aesthetic level, superheroes fulfill some kind of societal norm. They don't just act right, they look right, living up to our standards of beauty, ability, and normalcy. On the other hand, culture shows us who the villain is by telling us who doesn't behave or appear right. Well, the one that doesn't commit mass murder and terrorism. There is the minor matter of him blowing up a train. Um, Sorry, no, he caused caused a... How dare you speak of Nelson Mandela? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Can I just point out that he's this, whoever wrote this particular article is putting forward, and no offense to the guy, obviously he's suffering right now. Best best wishes to him, but he's putting forward Bruce Willis as the picture of the ideal male face, and you know he's not he's not a hideous guy, but I don't think he was ever. One of the things about Die Hard mm. was that he just looked like a guy. Yeah. He just looked like anyone. He didn't look like your Henry Cavill or even like your young Clint Eastwood. He was just a guy. So it's very strange for me to now be hearing that Bruce Willis exhibits some kind of beauty standard from this article. I would, I would say, though, that David Dunn, as he grows into his character, does embody a sort of square-jawed masculinity. And, he, and I think it's just, it's even, it's like the Clark Kent Superman difference that Christopher Reeve pulled off quite well, even though I'm not a big mm-hmm. fan of those films, of where he goes from his posture being quite slumped down, particularly after he's um, survived the, the train wreck when he's sitting on the hospital table, to being more confident and more upstanding and his, and his chin's held a little bit higher as he's filled with the, with the courage of conviction because his son lifts him up. So I do, I do think even though he's like not necessarily conventionally attractive, he's not like Jason Statham as a, as a, as a bald guy. Um, he he does embody the the masculine archetype that that comes with terrorism. There there is some Petersonian point. vibes going on with what you're describing mm. with the posture there. Mm. Well, the, the re- is it in Superman two that um, that you get that just change in posture that just communicates everything, or or was it? Yeah, it, it depends in it depends in which scene because there's so both versions where Margot Kidder tricks him well no there's only one way she tricks him into revealing his identity as clark ken he takes off the glasses and his suddenly his shoulders drop back and it does mm. look very different it's very impressive yeah, yeah I, re- I i haven't seen it for a while but i just remember that was yeah 
oh, it's a great bit of acting. Yeah. Uh, the Little White Lies article just continues with this bit I love. If superhero movies are about individuals, team up movies like The Avengers are more about collections of personalities than they are about an actual cohesive unit. It isn't. What? Does this guy have DID? <laughs> Uh, this is your brain through the ideology filter. Yeah, this this is not like cool fan fiction, bro. But this isn't in the movie at all. Like, the movie's actually very mm. straightforward. That's that's why I, I love the film. It actually executes yeah. on what I think is the director's explicit intent, and it does it very well. And it's um, his best film. I, yeah, I think I, I, I'd put it in one of my top in my, my top three films of all time. I think I'd, I'd agree that Unbreakable is the best. Mm. It's also. I'd say the one where the pacing doesn't hurt. I mean, we've talked about it a bit, Harry. Uh, Connor, how do you find the pacing? Uh, that, uh, well, generally in Shyamalan, uh, but do you think it it manages to um, suit Unbreakable? I think it suits Unbreakable very well because it's a character study. Mm. I think it doesn't suit his horror films very well um, because the I don't think he builds suspense well enough but i'm just thinking of the village which is probably the most egregious example yeah um i'm i'm not unnerved by the thing that is skulking about in the woods sufficiently enough to sit there and watch very long drawn out exposition scenes where you make sigourney weaver look like a bad actress <laughs> and it only shows up twice it yeah. only shows up twice sorry yes. um yeah the trailer really did um do us over well like he did it much better with the beast but like, the beast shows up what let, let's say charitably three times over the course of split and the sort of skulking fear is far better conducted than yes well it's, it's all ramping up to that tension uh, to uh, the the tension to that moment where it's revealed that the beast is real whereas yeah. every reveal that you get in the village actually serves to lower the tension and lower the stakes you think at first that there are monsters oh it turns out there are no monsters then you think, oh, maybe there actually is a monster. Oh, no, it's just Adrian Brody dressed up. Whereas in Split, everything starts to point you towards the inevitable conclusion that something is very wrong with this person, with, um, with, uh, with, the, with the primary antagonist, whose name I've just complete Kevin. I'll just call him Kevin. Mm -hmm. Something is very wrong with Kevin in a way that raises the stakes every time. With Unbreakable, with that early pacing style that Shyamalan had I agree with Connor because of the fact it's a more down to, despite being his, his superhero film it's a more down to earth narrative it's not trying to focus on these huge themes and the supernatural in the same way that the sixth sense was and because it's focused on the everyman the subdued nature of it actually works a lot better than all of the other early films I've seen of his yeah I would use subdued as well and I think the fact that Bruce Willis has far fewer lines than Jackson in it really conveys his ability to be very conflicted um I, I think bruce willis does a hell of a lot of great face acting in this oh yeah like like the, there's two the, there's three really standout scenes the one is where he's talking to audrey in the doorway and she asks whether or not he's ever seen anyone else I promise she won't cry and when he says no and she she breaks down and says you can ask me out sometime what he's holding back there is is fantastic um mm. then when he carries her up to bed in the Superman and Lois sort of <laughs> carrying pose, the have I night I had a nightmare bit. But the bit that always sticks with me, and it, it's it'll always stick with me since the first time I watched it with, with my dad. Um, it's the bit at the dinner table when when he slides mm -hmm. the paper across and just promises to his son to keep the secret. Whoa. Wow. Still it, still hits every time. The confidence to underplay it. Yes. It just it trusts the audience in a way that you I mean the Marvel stuff, it does not trust you. No. It wants to do everything massively. It kind of reminds me in a way of, um, I don't know how I feel about it now, um, but uh, Kurosawa's Ikiru, which is a lot more about the sort of the father trying to do something humbly to improve things and not get any glory from it. Um, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd throw that in a fancy. I'll have to watch that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the father is a civil servant, and it's about him trying to, uh, you know, redeem so, himself from that. Largely, it's it's an interesting one. It's a very interesting one. So, a, a subtler film than I usually get to talk about, but yeah, the, those moments are great. 
for me, if we if we're just unbreakable posting, I absolutely adore the scene uh, with Jackson breaking down the comic art um, mm. to the kind of clueless guy who's just going to get it for his kid, and yeah. that speaks to me for you know as someone who it it has been said maybe is a little too interested in the details, maybe sees something maybe a little it's a little more focused than would normally be normal for a, a film you know um i really appreciate someone drawing out the details and showing you why it matters you that know, was it, your literally me moment yeah <laughs> i was that black chap in a wheelchair it's true aren't we all in that moment we sometimes. were one <laughs> but yeah genu genuinely i just i love it because I love picking out those details. I love doing those readings. Um, and you know, at that at this point, we we've done all of them. We showed, especially with with the help of you guys, that uh, apart from you know, we skipped over one or two films. But basically, this is the case proven. There is absolutely nothing wrong. M Night Shyamalan confirmed based, and there is uh, yeah nothing to speak against that. Right? Did you did you uh, while I was briefly away? Lady in the Water. I haven't watched it. I okay, <laughs> and neither have I. But I have always been told that one, it would would have made a better comic book than a movie. Mm -hmm. Two, that the entire point was to insult Hollywood critics as access media hacks who have no clue what they're talking about. Ooh, and while, so all the hated it. While I am aware of that, and I do think it's slightly based because I will say Ebert and S Siskel and Ebert uh, seem like overrated hacks to me whenever I've gone back mm. and looked at their reviews of anything. They seem to be completely clueless, to, if I'm perfectly honest. They said that the yes. original Jurassic Park did not inspire any feeling of awe, despite the oh. fact... I'm, I mean, I'm not even a big Spielberg guy, okay. but come on, that's, that's a ridiculous statement to make. Um, but he, he, he does that... But the most that I'm aware of Lady in the Water is that M. Night Shyamalan, to disprove the critics, casts himself mm. as a writer whose prophetic writing will save the world, which feels just a little bit self-serving. Oh, hold, oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on. I always feel he's casting himself with a sort of Tarantino-esque sense of irony. He's like Tom Six in that brilliant film Human Centipede Part 2 Full Sequence, where Tom Six turns up as a, a celebrated movie director uh, who's just so influential that he's winning awards everywhere. Now, I've, you know? I've not seen The Lady in the Water, but from what I'm aware, it takes itself very seriously. Yeah, well, um, I was going to say, Tarantino might not be the best example, because in From Dust Till Dawn, he wrote himself as the character that gets to suck tequila off of Selma Hayek's foot. Wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. I hate feet, but not Selma Hayek. I mean... <laughs> I'm not a feet guy, but if it had to be anyone, <laughs> Harry's just hitting the wood button. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. people the, are trying the, to drag the, me away from the microphone. No, don't do it. These streams have been turning into WWYD a lot recently. Oh, someone did a Lotus Eaters one, and Harry and I both won our brackets. Oh yeah, I just barely managed to edge out Josh after some <laughs> absolutely brutal. Uh, contest that was going on before but thankfully I've confirmed that I definitely have the gay vote in my corner yeah I demolished nice. Stelios both from men and women and now he's calling to stop the steal I need a link on this, <laughs> I really do um, so we've, we've got a big gay audience and you've just admitted to demolishing Stelios, interesting well he is Greek mm. you were coming in from behind but eventually you overtook right <laughs> Whatever happened, everyone got a happy lead. ending. Very nice, very nice. Oh, we're, we're being warned off. I'm not even going to have time to ask you whether you go for Selma Hayek in Dust Till Dawn or Selma Hayek in Dogma. Uh, we'll have to move on. Dust Till Dawn. Yeah, Dust Till Dawn. Really? Wait, actually, yeah. pre or post vampire? Yeah, see, see. You have these complexities. Oh, we can't we can't be WWID streams. All right. So we've confirmed everything was good and they're probably all based. I mean, uh, we've had a question here about old. Old is about a massive government plot to manipulate people and wreck their health, you know? It's uh, Oh really? Know, I've not watched that one. Sounds interesting. Uh, comes out after a, a you know, a year where there was a certain, you know, I think there may have been large scale medical instances, uh, and uh, then this film is about the government um Putting um, a, a weird procedure that uh, causes premature uh, 
existence terminations, whatever the current uh, workaround for the censorship on YouTube is, you know, clearly old, very based. Um, and John, therefore, John Goras has just pointed out Salma Hayek and Desperado, and Ooh. I've got to go. If if it's a choice between the three, that's a, a very respectable choice, my friend. Very strong call, very strong call. She's very, um, she was in the faculty, but she she was just playing herself ridden with a cold the whole time. So, <laughs> you know, you, you best stick with uh, one of the other three films. I mean, Harry, I think you did say you, you had a, a minor footnote to add that yes, doesn't in um, any way detract from the sad argument. sad news I've got to break to everyone. After establishing so far that M. Night is our guy, undisputably, um, mm. He did then turn around and tear it all down. Our hopes and dreams were in the palm of his hands. And instead of nurturing them, taking care of them, he decided to close his fingers and crush them oh. in a fist by making knock at the cabin, which one was dreadful in and of itself. And I wouldn't recommend watching uh, if anybody wants to go and see it. Uh, I think it's maybe on streaming now. It's rubbish. It has It's um, an adaptation of a book wherein a lot of, uh, I'm trying to trying to cast my mind back to it now it was shockingly and memorably terrible it was one of those films unlike some of his other ones that had pacing issues this one was shockingly well done from a pacing perspective where there's always interesting events going on as a moment to moment viewing experience it was actually quite engaging the problem was that if you stop to think about any of it for a brief moment then it certainly was not the main plot revolves around a family that comprises two gay men and their adopted daughter taking a holiday in a cabin where these four people on the screen that we have right here mm -hmm. are uh, accost them and tell them that the world will end unless one of uh, unless the three of them willingly choose to sacrifice one of the other ones now you could make the argument that it's centered around the love of a family, the true love of a family, the ability to sacrifice for somebody else um, outside of yourself. You could say there are themes going on here, but also one of the major plot points that, revo uh, that recurs through the entire plot is the idea that they, these people might just be doing it because they're homophobic. And Rupert Grint's character in particular is revealed to have been someone from their past who did homophobically attack them purely because of the fact that the two main characters are gay. A oh, lot hold of on, plot... Harry. Sorry, ho hold on, Harry. This is a film where you get a gay couple with a kid and the world ends as a result of what the, of their decisions. Come on, this is the most based film going, right? Um, uh, to, to, uh, actually... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've read you, that town hall piece before. If you did, well, yeah, that was one of the things that put a bit of this into bad perspective, shall we say. Actually, I will say, uh, don't watch it. It's not worth it. Um, the, the character decisions make absolutely no sense because at the same time as seemingly having autonomy to make their decisions, the four people who show, they turn out to be the four horsemen of the apocalypse, except they're not actually the four horsemen apocalypse. They're not famine and all that sort of stuff. They're variations where it's like, Love, compassion, that very leftist LGBT. type versions of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, very strange. But mm -hmm. if I were to take a dissident reading of it, I suppose the world is about to end until one of the gay men is forced to, to kill his partner, at which point the world stops ending. So actually, reconsidering, Wait. take that as you will. Chat, you Hold know on. what to do. Hold on. <laughs> That's that's basically Sodom and Gomorrah, isn't it? Like uh, uh, God... it is basically implying. Well, it's it's outright stating that there is some kind of supernatural alternate power. And as far as I'm aware, M Night Shyamalan, looking into the book that it's based on, which has the same name, did change the en the ending of it. Where in the book they choose not to sacrifice any of them and let the world end around them. Right. So like that, like that recent Black Mirror episode, except. If the gay couple is broken up, God doesn't flood the world. Not just broken up, one of them has to murder the other. Yes. Yeah, willingly. Yeah. So so I'm actually seeing the dissident reading here. <laughs> but it once again it is heavily implied that they will all be meeting together in heaven again afterwards. Well. 
So take it as you will. If you want, having reconsidered it, if you want... <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind me, carry on, if Harry. If you carry want on. a base reading of it, then you can just choose to ignore a few lines of dialogue here and there. And I will also say that in the course of the narrative, uh, all of the coastline of West Coast and East Coast America, so basically all of the liberal mm -hmm. strongholds are entirely wiped out by floods. So make of that as you will. Are, as we, well. are we sure he didn't? <laughs> come on, Harry. He didn't mean on. this. Okay, I'm really uh, it's been a reconsider. while since I watched it. Um, and I am reconsidering now. Because <laughs> this is this sounds like the Barbie thing where they overlay dialogue on top of a plot, which, if you follow the logical premises, actually turns out to be based. I suppose I wasn't doing a deep enough reading of go. the film at the Get time. Get obsessive, Harry. Get obsessive. <laughs> I'll throw I get obsessive out about David Lynch films. I get obsessive about Robert Eggers films. Everything mm. else I'm generally bored by. Oh, the, the witch was actually really based, and then yes, all the, the witch is very. The witch that was is one of your pro-life pro -life readings, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. Well, it's, not, it's, it's not just that. It says some very um, concerning things about female nature. <laughs> also, the Christians were right the whole time, and Satan was stalking them. Yes, many such cases. <laughs> <laughs> I will throw out there just on this one. Um, possibly the, if we're not going to go for the full based reading. Maybe the reason that he changed the ending is because it's very similar to Cabin in the Woods, where Possibly. Uh, I, massive I think also... spoilers, the final required sacrifice is refused and they just let the world end. And so, um, you know, it's already called Knock at the Cabin. It's kind of close. Yeah. And then... I think for me, the main thing would be in the book, the in, in a struggle with the people who are holding them captive, the daughter gets shot. But because it's not a willing sacrifice, they that doesn't count. So they instead choose to let the world end anyway because they can't bear to murder one another. So I think it might have been changed mainly because M. Night Shyamalan read it and said, that's a real downer of an ending that people aren't going to be happy with if I put that up on screen. I want to give them a little bit of hope to hold on to. So it might have been that, but maybe based reading. Yeah, I mean, you've convinced me. you convinced me, Harry. I, I will say What's... I did read some interviews he did as well, and he said he was talking the whole time about how thrilled he was to finally have some proper representation in his films. He's been wanting this for so long. He wanted to make sure that there was a place for gays in his films, and he was so supportive yeah, of the dead LGBT by the end. movement. <laughs> what? I didn't dead by that. the end. That's what he chose to do. <laughs> He was telling you all along. This is genuinely this is genuinely a trope that like the Tumblrites whine about. It's the kill your gaze trope in fiction of where all gay oh. characters that are in a couple, one of them ends up tragically being killed in the end. It it drives me mad. Uh I so I in the reading for this and a little bit of scooting around, yeah, they were complaining about this. Uh -huh. And it's the same thing that happened with it chapter two. It's like, oh, oh we want to see that. gay stuff. We want to see gay stuff on the screen because it's so hard out there. We <laughs> it basically depicts their narrative that it's really <laughs> hard for you to be and gay. And then they say, we didn't like. I think we didn't like this. This was horrible. Sure, yeah, Pennywise used stuff. to be a gay icon. It's like what? Yeah. Oh. So, so what you're telling me is that the online gays were happier with the book ending where the child dies than where an ending where one of them makes a heroic sacrifice for the fate of the world. Interesting. Hmm, P much, P much, yeah. It's uh I do not like the discourse that goes around in in these circles. It is it is a frustration for me, you can imagine. Um what's so what's what's everyone's most accidentally based narrative then? Oh, just from um just, just from this? Gen well generally, but from this also works. I mean, I'm having a real "if I speak, I'm in trouble" moment. <laughs> just, just to clear, is this to do with a film that you were talking to me about privately? Uh, I wasn't even going to go with that one. Oh, okay. Um, I'm interested. You'll have to tell us in private if you're yep. not wanting to incur the eye I'll, of Sauron. I'll tell you post post stream. People may, may be aware there is a secret script, but I have not mentioned what the film is, and I have to rewrite a lot of it. Uh, I'm going to keep this subtle in light of a recent movie uh, that we covered 
um, I need to rewrite a major part of it. Um, oh, you know what? We're late in. Uh, tell you what, someone else go for it. I'll judge the spice level and then I might pitch in with a different one, which is actually related to a movie you covered, Harry, in, in some detail. Uh, yes, I think I know the one that you might be on about. Uh, that That's one that for me was uh, very cringe, uh, was American History X. Um, in, uh, but let me think. Secret, accidentally based. I will say I recently watched the first two Conjuring films for the first time and was shocked at how pro-Christian the whole things were. They were completely up on the idea that God is definitely real, mainly because of the characters that it's following. There is no doubt whatsoever the afterlife is real, and if you want to be able to live a good life, you need to live by God's word. All of that good stuff, and I was very surprised to see that in a film that came out post-2010. Very nice, very nice. Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tone my spice down, but I mean... If you, if you want to make the reading in American History X, you, your boy, it's uh, Derek, isn't it? Derek Vineyard makes all the effort and then uh, it, it it doesn't turn out well for his family. Was proven right proven. in his original conviction, perhaps? He yeah, relaxed but, but and this turned movie, out to yeah. have been a bad decision. Um, yeah, mm, yeah. The, the, the filmmakers really didn't understand what, what, what they were saying by that shooting at the end, did they? They really no, I think I mean, they were supposed to be going with the oh the cycle of violence, but instead it yeah, came across more yeah. like oh I guess I guess some of these people just are violent after all. It would have made sense with the um, it would have made sense more with the original ending when um, it in the original ending Derek goes back into the bathroom and shaves his head. Um, yeah, that but, would have made a lot of sense. That would have made sense. That got written out. Um, but, but, but accidentally based. Um, you know what? I'll go for the It's a Good Life segment from the Twilight Zone, which tells you that basically all kids need discipline as well as love. You Because if you don't provide strict discipline and boundaries, kids will go hugely off the rails. How about that? That's, that's far less spicy. That makes sense. <laughs> But then uh, if you want spicy readings, I do have a video on pro-life messaging in horror movies. The Wicker Man is uh, one one that surprises people. Um, How about so, yourself, Connor? We haven't heard from you. So I'll go, I'll go, with, I'll go with two. I'll go with a book and then a game. Um, one that no one's probably read, but it came out, I think it was published in the late 80s, and I really want to cover it for Lotus Ears at some point, mm. is The Wasp Factory by Ian Banks. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, to somewhat spoil it, it's about transgender serial killer in the Scottish Highlands, but it's a sort of David Reimer style situation. Mm. Um, very interesting implications for modernity. The game one is one that we're going to cover at some point. Uh, it's just going to take me forever to bloody script and office move, put it back. The first Life is Strange and its prequel. Ooh. are actually, they have some very conservative undertones to them. Mainly because the guy that you demonize the entire time, the Christian conservative veteran father, turns out to be the hero who was right all along. Uh, and I, I, I do love the originals. They were, they were utterly destroyed by the sequels, which were incredibly uh, overtly progressive. But the originals were great. That sounds. Oh, that does sound quite intriguing. Um, there's a similar thing in Bird Box. I've heard. Um, this. Yeah, there, there's a terribly bigoted character that's invited. I think played by John Malkovich. Memory is very fuzzy, but he gives out all these uh, warnings, and then ends up that his advice was correct. Um, kind of, kind of like the um. There's a, there's an old guy in Night of the Living Dead. Who's just like this? Ain't my problem. I'm gonna hold up in the attic, and he's the only guy that survives. Champion, champion. But, um, it kind of sounds like life is strange. Got what I like to call um, the treatment. This is it, critical drinker has the message, which is yep. such good framing that we all use it now. It's brilliant. I talk about the treatment, which is where something comes in and it's really successful. Everyone loves it, and it's kind of grounded it's normal mm. um 
And then the studio say, that's amazing. You did so well. Would you like a budget increase next season? But um, we'd like to make a few changes. Yes, absolutely. Um, looking at you, Stranger Things. Um, yes. If you, the first season is one thing, and then season two, the message starts getting titrated in. So does Life is Strange have that? So in the first game and its prequel, the characters are totally different to the sequels. The first one has, it's a very grounded time travel story that's against sexual predators and pro-fatherhood and mm. very pro-small town America. Um, and it also deals with things like, like mass medication. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's very good. And then the sequel is about two brothers whose dad die in a racist police brutality altercation and flee to Mexico from the authorities until the, before the border wall gets built. And it's just like, ugh. Ugh, uh, stop. Yeah. Sounds and fun. Then, yeah, and then the third one's about a lesbian who can like feel everyone's emotions. And she always wears the Progress Pride badge at all times. Oh, dear. Scream 6 it. Scream 6 it, yeah. Um, can, can, can I add another one that I've just recalled off the top oh, of my head? Oh, rock on, rock on. So for the first time ever the other week, I watched Day of the Dead. I'd watched oh. Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and it was the first time I'd been able to watch Night, uh, Day of the Dead because I managed to find somewhere where I could watch it. Not saying where. Um, and I was very surprised that in that film, the whole film seems to be attempting to point to the idea because the film, the plot is they're in the underground military base where they've got scientists trying to work on either a cure or a way to tame the zombies and the military mm. are very very suspicious of all of the scientists all of the way through and are portrayed somewhat as the bad guys of the film but then later on in the film it turns out that the scientists or the lead scientist really was just wasting everybody's time <laughs> trying to trying to tame one particular zombie and even to tame that zombie he has to feed that zombie the remaining body parts yeah bub the, the body parts of all of the other military members and scientists who've died as they've been trying to do their job. So the military guys being suspicious of these mad scientists were actually right the whole time, and them putting their faith in the scientists is what eventually gets everyone killed, when mm -hmm. really the military could have just been clearing out the zombies the whole time. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've got another afterwards. Please go. Oh, oh yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead Connor. Uh, I assume people here have seen Last Night in Soho. Oh, yes. Yes. So I it's actually mixed on it, but yeah. um, it was great until they overdid it with the CGI faceless ghost men thing. Mm, yeah, because uh, then then they just tipped their hand too much. I did a review ages ago back when I had an American Spectator column, and my take on it was that it's it's a horror film for the sexual revolution, where it like sleeping around and this sordid subculture of the of the 60s which is so valorized as a time of of mm. free love and and enlightenment actually drove certain women so insane to the point that they were murderous and instead if you just meet a nice fella who will help you out when shit hits the fan you'll get along mm. so that was the that's the accidental subtext of that one interesting mm. i'd have to rewatch it there is something in there's a lot of it could be in there because just the trouble is there's some of the modern trappings uh, you know, that um, distract you from seeing that. But yeah, that might be in there. It, just Harry, when you talked about um, Day of the Dead, I thought, to be honest, Dawn of the Dead is pretty, pretty feisty too. If, if you take it as a condemnation of basically the consumerist cattle class. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, it's... It's uh, in both incarnations. That movie is pretty, pretty solid on that. Though I will say, as a, as a Zack Snyder fan, mm. um, I I really did not like his remake. I I thought I, I thought it bled James Gunn. That was his debut, yeah. wasn't it? It was his debut, yeah. And James Gunn mm. wrote it, and you could tell. Sorry if my audio's changed. By the way, I've had to change up my setup. No That's worries, right. no worries. Yeah, I mean, I. I am tempted. It'll have to be another streams discussion, but yeah, the James Gunn politics are interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, what about, what about, what about the Predator Oh. <laughs> Maybe. There's, those those Scooby-Doo movies are actually 
They're both really enjoyable and really subversive. I've never once Just taken a political reading of them, so I'm I'm willing to dig in. Oh, watch the deleted scenes and the and the deleted script parts, and holy hell, are they subversive? It's like it would have if they hadn't have edited it, it would have been Ryan Johnson Scooby Doo. <laughs> really? Yeah, they were going to make Fred gay and impotent, and Velma was actually a lesbian who's been lusting after Daphne this entire time. Oh well, thank what, was wasn't there a scene where she does a, like a dance on a yes. table, takes a yes. jumper? I have off seen and... that scene many times. Yeah. Wait, what? There's a scene where who takes the top off? Which one? Uh, uh, Velma. Velma. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's disgusting. Where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you can, I'll I'll send you a link so you I can go and down vote and report. It. I can block that link. Thank you. Yeah. No worries, no worries. I'm glad to help out, friends. Um, I was I was going to say for the for the other accidentally based films, the Predator relaunch with Adrian Brody. <laughs> Oh, Predators, I've not this, watched that one. That could go in an interesting direction. Proceed. <laughs> well, because um don't so all of the all of the people that are it because I am I am I right in thinking that the dude who looks like Topher Grace but isn't was basically a serial child murderer? Um then, sorry, well, it's been too long for me. It's been too long. Because um, each each one of them did something really screwed up. And then pretty much everyone dies except like normative couple guy and a girl at the end. Hmm. Oh, huh. I mean, I, I was told uh, to take the opposite track. I was hanging out with a friend last night who has a fr who's friends with a university film professor, so exactly the type you would expect. Who was talking about the first Predator being a film with the subtext of a complete emasculation of the Hollywood nineteen eighties macho man by essentially a walking vagina with teeth. <laughs> oh. Because obviously the Predator has the um, weird face things going on yeah. there. Is, a, is this, is this, a, is this analogous to that time that Arnold Schwarzenegger slept with his ugly maid? <laughs> maybe eating maybe isn't that's eating. the inspiration. Your one uh, ugly you. mother. <laughs> I bet I've got E. Michael Jones' Monsters from the Ed over there. I, Ah, I'm so tempted to look at Predator in that now. <laughs> oh, dear, dear, dear. What, what was, um, I was thinking of a Denis Villeneuve film as well. Have you seen Enemy? Uh, the one no, the I think I, I've seen Prisoners, uh, not Enemy. Enemy. What was Enemy? Enemy is the one with Jake Gyllenhaal versus slightly more psychopathic Jake Gyllenhaal fighting no. over. Well, basically, they go on a wife swap. In the end, Hello? eventually, and there's a, a lot of arachnid imagery. And once again, this is mm -hmm. this is a take that has been filtered through a friend of mine that he got from his film professor friend. So take it with a pinch of salt. But there's a lot of arachnid imagery in that film, and apparently, in films, it goes back to ancient Greek mythology. Whenever you have an arachnid imagery, it's basically talking about women being evil. So mm -hmm. the the point of that film might be that. He's having an internal conflict with himself because the women around him are all corrupting influences. Hmm. That would track for Blade Runner 2049. Gosh. I don't... I, I would think that I, Blade Runner 49, 2049 has the commodification of relationships, men being sold on these fake online relationships. Basically, Ryan Gosling's character in that is an OnlyFans subscriber. Yeah. And yeah, he's, he's a Twitch moderator. Yeah, he's a Twitch <laughs> moderator. And he's completely broken by it. Yeah. Oh dear. I know I know about reading too much into that symbolism. I've I've had to go back to Freud for something coming up on Christopher Smith's triangle. Um and feet refer to genitals, eyes refer to genitals, ev ev everything. What about genitals? Refers... What do they point to? Um, Sherbet, weirdly enough, oh, I, yeah. I do not get the Viennese, it they throw me off. But I, I hadn't read Freud before, but got I, you see where the stereotype comes yeah. from. He's he, everything is built around the idea that you're afraid of your uh, genitals being damaged in childhood. Why would Freud think this? I don't know. What did he mean by this? Uh, who can say? <laughs> oh, dear, <laughs> anyway. So, <laughs> oh, Shellob posting has uh, commenced. You summoned this. You summoned this. Oh, did you see? Did you see Lizzo's flute performance the other day? <laughs> no, 
Um, Harry, you're not aware of this. The... I'm aware of it, but I refuse. Lizzo posting must be stopped. Okay, so so I just responded to it because it's Lord of the Rings themed with they have a cave troll. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did see that, actually. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, no. Why? Why? Okay, well, we started Lizzo posting, so I think we might want to draw it off here. I think we've um, got a bit off topic now. Yeah, I think... Um, you know, I, I like these. Uh, I, I think you know what the biggest sort of twist ex- in M Night's next film would be actually. Go on, I'm here for it. Lizzo, she would quite literally be the biggest twist oh. he could put in his films. <laughs> Jeez, gosh darn it, gosh darn it. Well, um, I'm ending. Uh, sorry, I'm aiming for these end of the month streams to be uh, shorter, more lighthearted, fun, and uh, I, I think that's certainly fulfilled everything I'd hoped for. I think we've concluded indisputably that M. Night Shyamalan is absolutely based. He has earned his red eyes. And uh, I, I, who could object to this now? You know, just don't look at select films that he, you know, if you ignore a fair few of the ones he's made, then uh, it's indisputable. Right? Just don't watch The Last Airbender. Yeah. What? Or apparently. Um, oh wait! Uh, didn't he make After Earth? Oh god, he did. Yeah, and the happening, which. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, let's not look into that because I'll be proven wrong, and I like my crack theory at the moment. But um, yeah, so folks, uh, I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, I don't know what it'll be next month, but uh, are you, I'm going to use these end of the month streams for a little fun for. For going off um, off the beaten track, so to speak. Um, massive thanks, Harry. Massive thanks, Connor. Really lovely chatting with you guys on this one. Pleasure as always. Thank you for having us on. Sweet. And chat, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to end the broadcast now. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. All the best, folks. Thanks, y'all.